All right, we have an image. Perfect. Yeah, welcome to this session, uh, War Games, Java Vulnerabilities and Why You Should Care. Um, you probably know, if you are older, you know, who knows the movie War Games? Okay, this is not about the movie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and who knows the other thing, Spy vs. Spy? That's probably the older ones. <laughs> okay, so... Um, my name is Gerhard Grunwald. I'm working for Azul as a senior developer advocate. I also have a Java user group in Münster in Germany. So if there is someone interested in speaking at or Jack, just let me know. And before we start, there's one important thing. Free beer. Who's up for free beer? Okay, that's, that's good. So you go there, it's our booth, and you sign up for the tickets because we just have 240. And then you can go to the next pub. It's out of the door, right, and there's the queue action pub from 5 to 8. There is a party and you can get drinks and food. Just You have to just register, okay? So I'm a developer. I'm not a security expert. Do we have security experts in the room? You can leave. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, but at November 24th and 2021, there was this thing. Who was affected by Lock4Shell? Yes, same for me. And that made me think, because I was like, oh, damn it. Because I, when I was starting development and all these things professionally, I thought like security, this is for the other guys. This is the guys where I just throw the code over the wall and then they do all the stuff and make it secure, it's all fine. It's not my job, right? So that was uh, 20th century thinking. And the software landscape at that time looked totally different. And that's probably true for all the older people here in the room. So because the code was self-written and closed source you know, most of the times, and it was managed in a repository or even on the local machine in a folder, right? So we had no really code system. So like it was like copy the folder and rename it. That was our, our repository. Everything was built manually, delivered on hardware, even USB sticks or CDs, DVDs, floppy disks in the beginning. Um, and it ran on closed networks or local servers. It has been large monolithic systems, connected systems only in government staff or banking or energy providers, and we had the full control over the source code. I think this is the big difference, right? And the vulnerabilities at that time also have been different because it was like uh, password hacking, checking the garbage, oh look, there's a note, might be a password, let's try it. Uh, computer viruses, it was the start of all these things happening. Um, early days of hacking via the internet, and then time flies, and suddenly we are in the 21st century. And like I said, I never thought about security. So who thought about security? Who's really into security here? This is good. It's better than nothing. <laughs> so, uh, and things look different now, because today it's a lot of stuff is open source. Who's using open source here in production code? See, right, this is a big difference. And we have distributed source code management systems. We have automated build systems like CI CD systems and host the stuff in artifact repositories, we run on public networks. We have APIs that are accessible via browsers even. And everything is connected these days. And we don't have the full control over the source code anymore. We just trust stuff, right? This is mainly, oh yeah, I, I just got the latest update and use it, it's cool. Okay, fine. So today we have a whole software supply chain, which is different from the 20th century things. So the vulnerabilities also changed a lot. So these days, social engineering, this is the most dangerous thing. Who heard about SIM swapping? If you never heard about it, look it up. It's absolutely fascinating what you can do. And you think about two-factor authentication and how secure it can be. It's really interesting. I don't go into details here. We have malware and, and ransomware everywhere. It's spread via short messages on your phone even. Everything that is connected will be hacked and spreading malicious code is way easier than it was ever before. So the whole software supply chain is the target of attacks these days. But before we start, and this was one of the reasons why I did the session, when I looked into, after Lock4Shell, I looked into all these things and then I stumbled upon so many acronyms. The US people are really crazy with acronyms and had no idea what it means. So I decided to give you some ideas because maybe you stumble upon the same. So it's, for example, CWE, 
common weakness enumeration. Who heard about that? Yeah, that's good. So it's a community developed list of software and hardware weakness types. This is nothing that is from a government or something. This is really something from the community. And you will find it, this is, uh, you will find a lot of QR codes in that presentation where you can just scan, check it up. And also there's the link down there. Um, I stumbled upon this once, but some uh, vulnerabilities you find a CVE, a CWE, sorry, and then you now know where to look it up. Then there's the so-called NVD. That's the National Vulnerability Database. And I, I don't read all this, it's, it's too much. You can read it faster than I can read it here. Uh, but it's in principle a database that is handled by the US government and it's globally available so you can access it. It even comes with an API and you can get an API key to that and then you can even build it into your application and check for stuff if you would like to, right? Depends on your application. And it uses the so-called SCAP protocol, Security Content Automation Protocol, and they manage all the vulnerabilities in that database. This is in principle it. And you can find it under nvd.nist.gov. Right? There you can find the NVD database. And why do we need a database? Because we have vulnerabilities. And they have the so-called CVE acronym, which is Common Vulnerability and Exposure. And this might be more known by the most of, our, of you. Because um, if we take a look at it, it, the CVE program mission is to identify, define, and catalog publicly disclosed cybersecurity vulnerabilities. And you will find them under cve.org. And the NVD, the database, it contains all the CVEs. Right? And the CVE, for example, for Log4Shell, this is what we use. But if you go to the security guys, they say this one. This is CVE 2021-44228. Right? I just can guess that it was in year 2021 and it was the 44,228th vulnerability in that year, probably. So this is the code for Log4Shell. You can look that up and you will find it in the NVD. So, and then you will find something like that. You don't have to read through this stuff because I just would like to explain what it contains. So we will find that text for Log4Shell and it tells you what versions have been affected, the vulnerability itself, is explained, and then how you get there, right? So from which version to which version, and all these things. It's, it's a complete description of the CVE. So that's quite useful. You can look it up in the NVD. Okay, then we have CVSS. Now we have the database. It contains the CVEs, which are all the vulnerabilities, but now you have to judge, is it critical or is it not critical? Therefore, we need some kind of score. And that's the Common Vulnerability Severity Score, CVSS. And then to make it more complex, there's not one, there are two, right? So there's the CVSS 2.0, that was the way they started. And you can already see we have three different categories, low, medium, high. And even if there wasn't a vulnerability, it was already low, which is a little bit strange, right? And its score goes from 0 to 10, and that has been the, the fractions, right? And then they decided, hmm, that's not good enough. We need more. So they created CVSS. First it was 3.0, then now it's 3.1. And they changed the zero is now none, which makes sense. And then we have low, medium, high, and critical. So the last, the, the high from before that, it's now split into high and critical. Right? And if we take that, and then we take, for example, the log for shell issue, then you see this was in CVSS 2.0, it was 9.3, which is high. CVSS 3.1, it was critical, which is 10. This is the score of that log4shell issue. And you will find probably for some years, you will always find the, the CVSS 2 score and the 3.1 score. In the older ones, they only have the 2, right? So this is also, you can look it up. You see it's in the NVD NIST gov. There's all the details about these things. You can find it there. So it's worth going there, but be aware it's not really a user-friendly page. Who knows, whoever took a look at the NVD database? You like it? Huh. Yeah, me neither. So the question is, because this is a Java conference, who is a Java developer here in the room? Yes. Who's Kotlin? Good. Some NPN guys here? JavaScript? Ooh. Okay. Is Java secure? That's the question. Well, first of all, there's the OpenJDK Vulnerability Group, right? So this is a group, um, it's a private forum, 
of known members of the OpenJDK community. And it's not like you say, oh yeah, I'm a security expert, I will be part of that group. No way. So they choose which people they pick, right? It's all based on trust. So they receive and review reports of vulnerabilities. That means if you figure something out, then you can report it to that vulnerability group, and then they will take care about it. So they collaborate on fixing their stuff. They don't fix it themselves, right? So it, it's fixed by other people. They just coordinate all these things and the fixes. They also make sure that there's a list, a maintained list of CVEs patched for each release. You know that if you download, for example, JDK, 1708, there's a list of CVEs fixed in this one, right? And this is maintained by this group. And they also track CVEs by component because we have a modular JDK, and now this, the question is who's using JDK 6 or 7? 8? I'm just talking about production, 8, okay? 11? Good, 17? Now the field is 21? Nobody? Okay, <laughs> half? So, and because we have a modular JDK now, that means you can have CVEs that only attack a certain part of the, JV, of the JDK, right? So it's, it makes sense to track CVEs by components, by modules, because not everybody uses all the modules in the JDK. By the way, there's someone using JLink here to create custom... Yes, my hero. You are all, most of you are more than JDK 8, it's above JDK 8, that means 9, 11, whatever. There's JLink. JLink can create, but I will come to that. It, it's part of the presentation, so you should use it. Um, they discuss OpenJDK security-related issues. Uh, they do not actively test the OpenJDK source code, right? This is just a forum. And um, then we come to the Java release cycle, right? This is the old one from six to seven, four and a half years, seven to eight, three years. And that was the first long-term support version, so-called. Um, then there's a new one, looks like this. We have lots of releases. Every six months we have a new one. And the black ones are the long-term support versions. And you see it, it, the distance between, or the, the time between the LTS versions is two years. Okay, why is that related to security? Well, it's pretty easy. If you have this long release cycle, then you see this is the number of features per the release in JDK 8. It was 56, JDK 9, 91 because of the modularization. You can imagine that you wait for three years, then you switch to a new JDK and suddenly there are 91 new features that can be a problem. So if you have something like this, this is the new release cadence, you see with each release we have less features in each release than before. And that means less features per release means less potential vulnerabilities. It's easier to test and more secure. That's the reason why this is, this is one of the parts that makes it more secure. Then we have Java updates. And now I have some interesting questions for you. Who knows CPU updates? Okay. Critical patch updates. A critical patch update only contains fixes for vulnerabilities. And that's it. Critical issues, right? And then we have the PSU, which is the patch set update. Who knows that? Okay. Who, who downloads the latest JDK versions from the internet every four months? Probably most of you. This is PSU. This is the patch set update. So the difference is the patch set update contains the CPU and then it also adds non-critical fixes and it can add new features, small features, nothing like Loom, but small things. And this is a potential risk because it can introduce new vulner vulnerabilities, right? So how it works is, as in, for example, we have 1701. On top, we have the PSU that contains the CPU. And on the bottom, we have just the CPU. So when, in April, the next release comes out, the, you see this uh, PSU on top, it contains the fixes and new features, where the CPU takes the last, the 1701 PSU, and just fix the issues, and that's it. So feature-wise, the CPU is always one quarter behind the PSU. The reason why you don't know that, because you have to pay for it. And there are just a few companies who offer the CPU releases. And this, is, this goes on to October, and then it looks like that. So it's always the CPU comes a little bit later and with the features. So you have to keep in mind, updates are available four times a year. Patch set updates contains the CPU plus additional stuff. And critical patch only the critical fixes. 
So why do they matter? Well, there's an example in JDK 8 update 252. That was a PSU and that introduced a feature that prevented Hadoop cluster and solar from running. So it means if you updated to that one, it didn't work anymore. When you use the CPU update that only contained the fixes from the former PSU, which was 242, then there was no problem. Right? So this is the reason why CPU updates make sense. Not for everyone, I totally agree. But let's say you have something like a customer which is an automotive producer and they have Java in the car. So they have to make sure that this works, right? They don't want to break stuff. This is the reason why we have CPU updates and they are only available, I think, from Oracle, Azul, and Bellsoft. These are the only three companies that offer <laughs> CPU updates. So the up impact without updates, if we take a look at JDK 11 and you stick to 11, then we had six CVEs for JDK 11, GA. Then one was fixed, five stick in there till 11.05, until they got fixed. Then 11.11 .11 has another one, then 12 got 10 new CVEs. Each CVE is a vulnerability, right? And then 13 was fixed and then there was nothing anymore. But that means if you stick to JDK 11.0, you have 17 CVEs open in your source code. In the JDK itself, it's not your application, it's the JDK. So and there have been nine medium ones. The low ones, okay, but the medium ones, hmm, you might be careful with that. So you really have to keep your JDK up to date. And I talk to people, they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I would say, if it ain't broke, at least keep it up to date, okay? So it, it's not that hard and you should do that. Oh, now we come to the modular runtime images. And um, there's JLink. Who knows JLink? Okay, but I saw already not really many people use it. You can reduce the risk of vulnerabilities because what it does, it can create a Java runtime environment just for your application, right? So it can strip down the JDK or the parts of the JDK that you, your application needs to run on. And that also means if you remove stuff from the JDK or from the JRE, then there is less vulnerabilities possible, right? Removing unused modules means reducing risk for vulnerabilities. So you should really think about using JLink to create your own runtime images. Yes, hackers cannot attack what isn't there. Right, then we come to the software supply chain, which is, uh, it starts with us, the developers, and we drag stuff in from a central repository. We have our own repositories where we submit to, it goes into CI, CD, this drags other stuff from the repository and then we build containers there, put it in artifact repositories. This can also go back to the central run or it can also go back to or out to production, right? So this is, you will find similar things. It's, it's not the general one, but this is a one drawing of the software supply chain. Well, you can attack it here or there or there. So everywhere. You can attack this supply chain and this happens. And some of this stuff sounds so simple that you think, ah, no way, it will never happen to me, but trust me, it happens. So for example, a hacker can pretend to be a known contributor, submit bad code. Sounds very stupid and simple, but works, right? You can even compromise by just injecting malicious code if you take over the account of a committer. It might not happen in your company, but open source projects, can you guarantee? You don't even know all, all of the contributors most of the times. So then uh, hackers could retrieve passwords from build scripts, I saw that, right, which is not really a good idea. Um, you can, if you don't make sure where stuff is coming from, you can even abuse the ICD systems. Or you can hack upload modified packages to the artifact repository. And this all sounds like oh, I'm not affected, won't never happen in my company, but this happens a lot, which is interesting because I never thought about it. Of course, if you have, you all know that you get a mail from your bank, which is not your bank, and then you click somewhere and fill out some form and all these things can happen and happen if it's not really trusted stuff that it's coming from. So we have some facts, I just checked the web there's from the Sonar type state of the software chain report. They figured out that over the last three years, there was an increase of supply chain attacks by 742%, which is really a lot, right? 
and they do that all the all the every year i think so there's another one this is from the nist which is the national vulnerability uh, database guys they did that and they just i hope you can see it we have the different types of vulnerabilities low medium high and then you see that there was an increase in 2017 it bumped up and it's still rising and in 2021 there was already 20,142 different unique bugs and security vulnerabilities recorded in the NVD. So that's a lot of stuff that's going on there. Another thing which is really bad is uh, I talked to Christian Grobmeier, who's one of the <coughs> contributors to Log4j, and he told me this is from March, so that's not the current number anymore. In March this year, still 34% of all downloads of Log4j have been the ones that still contains the issue. Even if it was fixed 15 months ago, people just still download the old stuff which is vulnerable. It's lazy users, right? That can happen. I think it's down to 27%, but still, just think about it. It's a lot, right? If you download stuff, make sure it's secure. Uh, this is that's a big problem. Transitive dependencies is you have a dependency in your project, you know this is secure, but you have no idea what this dependency drags in for other stuff. And six out of seven project vulnerabilities are coming from these transitive dependencies. This is also from the Sonar type report, which is quite interesting. <clears throat> and many people are not aware that this stuff happens. Then there's another one which is Synopsis, they are also big in security. And they figured out that um, they, they scanned all their, their code bases and they found at least one vulnerability in 84% of all the scanned code bases. And 48% of that scanned ones contained high-risk vulnerabilities. So this is just facts that you can read up. So security is really important, even if you think, oh, I'm not affected. You probably are, right? They also figured out open source. How much was it used in their scanned code bases? It was used in 96% and we saw that nearly everybody was like, yes, we use open source. And from that scanned source, uh, code bases, 76% have been open source. This stuff was available everywhere, right? And that leads me to open source in general, because uh, who's an open source contributor here? Great, this is for you guys. You all know this licenses, right? You ever read it? Really read it? Let me highlight some points for you. Is provided as is, right? So without warranty of any kind. And in no event shall the authors or copyright holders be liable in any claim, damages or other liabilities. It says exactly what it is. What does it mean? I owe you nothing. That's what it means. If you use open source with these kind of licenses, then it's up to you to make sure that it's secure. These guys just say, okay, I do that in my spare time, I give it to you, but I'm not really reliable for, for stuff that can happen, right? So it's like this, you probably know that. And that was funny because I was in Nebraska when I showed that and then I figured out, oh, I'm in Nebraska, okay. <laughs> so this is, um, you have to keep in mind, open source maintainers are not suppliers, right? You don't have any business relationship with them. You don't sign a contract when you use Log4j, right? You just download and use it, and you trust it's, it's working. It's no problem. And then you blame the contributors. Why is it not secure? So it's up to you to make sure that the stuff is secure that you download from the internet. It's not by the open source maintainers. Of course, they should make sure as good as they can, but if they have this license and you agree to that, it's up to you. Keep that in mind, because that's really important. So what can we do? There's one thing called shift left. Who heard about shift left? Okay. Um, we have the software supply chain here. And I told you, for me, it was in the past, and I'm really honest, that that's how I felt it. So I just write the code, put it in the repository, and that's it with security. I'm not responsible. Usually we say we have the dev on the left side, and then we have the ops on the right side of the diagram. And shift left means that the left side, so the developers, should take more care about security. That means shift left, in principle, right? And uh, we all know the DevOps thing, which became DevSecOps. And if we take a look at this DevOps loop, 
which starts with planning, coding, and then we have a building, releasing, and you see this is all on the left side, which is dev. Then we come to deployment, operating the stuff, monitoring the stuff, back to planning. This is this DevOps loop. And where's security in that one? Is it left? Is it right? It's everywhere. Everything is really affected, or security has to affect all these areas. There's no left or right in this diagram, okay? So, shift left, yes. But we also say validate right. And we will come to this later on. So, <clears throat> first thing you have to do, update your JDK. Who is always updating his JDK here in the room to the latest version? Yeah, I, I know that. I, did the, I didn't the same. So I was just downloaded something and I stick to it for months and then, oh yeah, there's a new version. So I upload it from time to time. I downloaded the new version. So, but not on a regular base. Once I figured that out, things changed. So is someone using SDK man here? <coughs> yeah, which is a great tool to update your JDK. So they support many uh, JDK distributions and it's a command line tool. It's only on Linux and Mac. It's not on Windows. I think on Windows there's something like uh, Coffee Latte, which is similar. And you can download and install JDKs. That's what it does. Easy. So if you are too lazy to go to the website, download the JDK, install it yourself, just use SDK Man and you're good to go. If you have no idea when there is a new update, I was a lazy guy and this is a shameless plug because this is my own tool. Um, I wrote it just because I was not sure, oh, when is the next update coming out? I have no idea. So I would like to have a tool that keeps track of that stuff. So I wrote this tool, which is called uh, JDK Mon. It has all the JDK distributions, more than 20, even GraalVM. And if you have JavaFX, it also supports that one. And it just tells you, it sticks in the, in the taskbar and it tells you if there's a new update available for whatever distribution. And it is available for Windows, Linux, and Mac. And it has also information about vulnerabilities, because that's what I added. So this is the tool. If you open the window, this is how it looks like. So it shows you the stuff that you have installed. Then it, do you see this uh, yellow, orange, green buttons? This is, you can download the stuff directly by clicking on it. And then you have to install it on your own. So it doesn't install it. It just tells you there's a new version. If you would like to download, click here. If you see this red thing and you click on it, and it will tell you all the vulnerabilities for this specific JDK. And this is, doesn't matter what you use. If you use Tamarin, Zulu, Microsoft, Corredo, they are all based on OpenJDK. It's the same source code. So that means if there's a vulnerability for OpenJDK, it's there for Zulu, Tamarin, Adoptium, whatever. Right? So then you can click on the CVEs and it will directly bring you to the NVD and show you the, the entry. So this is the reason why I just applied for an API key for the NVD database, which is free. And then you can just click there and then you get all the information about the CVEs in the JDK itself. Okay, another thing you can do, static code analysis. Probably everybody knows that. It's usually part of code reviews. It identifies uh, vulnerabilities in source code. That means at the implementation phase, which is really cool because it's inexpensive. You, you type code, you program something, it tells you, eh, that's a problem. That's vulnerable. So it's, there's a standalone tool. There are IDE plugins. And if you go to the nist.gov page, they come up with this list. This is not rated. They just say this is just a, a list of uh, static code analysis tools that you can use to make your code more secure. Right? And you see there are paid ones. There are free ones. There's all kinds of stuff available. And there's also the link. There's find security bugs. Does someone know that? Or find bugs, maybe? This is the older version. Yeah, so this is just the newer one. And some facts about that. It's free of charge. It extends spot bugs. And I think spot bugs is the success of find bugs. And it has 400 plus bug patterns. Uh, there's a plugin for IDEs. This is just an example. It's hard to read. Sorry for that. It just sticks in your IDE. You code something and it tells you, oh, here's a vulnerability. You might want to check that. So then there are vulnerability scanners. Who is using a vulnerability scanner here in the room? Okay, that's cool. In CI, CD. And now in production. A few. Who is using an agent in production to do that? Okay, cool. So what is it? First of all, it detects vulnerabilities. It's using a database. It also knows its probes for common flaws. They know these things. And then... Uh, 
It monitors misconfigurations and coding flaws. It helps using only artifacts from reliable sources, not somewhere from some website. And it helps also using only the last secure version because they know which is the last safe version to download, so they just use that one. And they monitor the appearance of new packages with fixed vulnerabilities and can tell you, oh, you use that, th that thing, there's a new version which fixes this and this vulnerability. And it can update your dependencies automatically. And usually how they work or where they work is directly at your source code, right? It can work in the repository, it can scan, fix and monitor it. It can work at the CI CD level. Even artifactory scanners are available and you can use it in production. The problem here is that usually if you would like to do it in production, you need some kind of an agent. So the question is, what is, what is an agent? So if, if we have the JVM and we, this is our, all the parts of the JVM, like class loader system, JVM memory, execution engine, then it comes with an API, which is the instrumentation API. So the JDK itself or the JVM itself has an API. And then you can attach an agent, which is a Java program. And this agent can, for example, add some callback mechanisms to specific parts of the JVM. In this case, to the class loader subsystem. Every time the, JD, the JVM loads a class, it will go back to the agent and tell the agent, you know what, I load this class. And then the agent can do something. It can look up in the NVD, for example, is there a vulnerability for this class? Or where does this class belong to? Is there a library? All these kind of things. But you can imagine that if you do that with every class loading thing, it takes time, right? Because it, you add something from the outside to the JVM, to the running JVM, and that can have an impact. Okay. So, there are different vulnerability scanners uh, available. We also have one which is on top of this list. And then we have Black Duck, X Ray, Sneak. Who's using Sneak? Black Duck, someone? You like it? No? <laughs> Yeah, that's what I heard from many people. I don't know why. Sonar Cube, someone? Oh, nice. Okay, so sneak code, just as an example, uh, it's free or paid, depends on you. It supports more than nine languages. It has a developer first approach, which covers this shift left thing, right? And it's a standalone version. You have plugins for IDEs, and it goes up to CI CD, so they don't do production because of this agent reason and the overhead. And usually what it looks like, you don't have to read it. The important part, it tells you where is the problem, what is the problem, right? And then you can fix it. That's the idea. This is just an IntelliJ uh, plugin. They have plugins and they can, like I said, they can go up to CI CD systems and check. Then there's SonarCube, lots of you use that. And the screenshot is even worse than I have. Um, we have, again, free and paid version, more than 30 languages, so which is really cool. 4,800 plus analysis tools, um, or rules, sorry, a standalone version plugin also just stops at CI CD because they say now we don't go to production because it has this overhead and we don't want to do that. The overhead means it brings down your production code in performance. And that means then if you would like to run it in production, you need to increase the number of nodes to get the same performance. And that means more cost. And that's the reason why many companies decide, ah, we trust the CI CD systems. Right. So this is how it looks like, terrible to read, even on my screen. But uh, again, important is they tell you where is the problem, what is the problem, and why. Right. So which, which is quite good. And then we have our own one, and I have to tell you the difference, because this is different from all the other ones. Um, we are not security experts, but we do JVMs. So we saw the problem with the production scanning with the agents. And then we thought about it. Why don't the JVM itself tell something else what it loads? Because it does it anyway. So we created a little tool, which is called a forwarder. And you install that forwarder in your own infrastructure. And then the JVM, you start your application, it just from time to time calls the forwarder and tells him, OK, I loaded this class, I loaded that class. And the overhead is below 1%, because it doesn't, it doesn't do any anyway. So we only run in production, we only support Java because it's in the JVM. It means everything that is in the JVM and running on the JVM, of course, is supported. We have fewer false positives and I can tell you why. And we do also code inventory. So that means because we know the code that is loaded 
and we monitor it. So we can tell you if you have a large code base with lots of old code, then you probably don't know if all the code is always used or if it's still in use at all. We just monitor that and we can tell you, for example, you do a report after six months and then we can tell you, you know what, all these classes here you never loaded. So maybe you can get rid of it, right? stuff like that. And it's no Java agent because it's inside of the JVM. So what it works, we don't give you an interface, we just give you this website because this was made to integrate in other tools, for example, SonarCube or Sneak or whatever. But what we can do, we can tell you the libraries, where are vulnerabilities, we can tell you the score, and now the difference is we can tell you if you ever use it or not. That means you can have a dependency on log4j, which is vulnerable, we tell you there's a dependency, this is vulnerable, but you never load it. So you're still safe. And sometimes that's quite helpful. So this is the difference with the uh, Azul vulnerability detection here. So if we take a look at a secure software supply chain, then it could look like this. So we have the supply chain, and then usually you have stuff like Spring or Log4j, whatever third-party stuff you use. Who's a Spring user? Also Spring Boot. Who is, does use uh, Quarkus? Micronaut. Now the fancy one, Helidon. Okay, something else. Cool. Okay. So we have these different dependencies that you can use, like third-party libraries, and then we have this stuff like Cassandra or Kafka. Has someone ever been to Kafka Summit? No? It's interesting, you go there, it's just for Kafka users. And then we have been there with the Azul booth, and we tell them, and then they ask us, what, what is Azul doing with Kafka? And we tell them, oh, this is about Java. Ah, we don't use Java. So you tell them, ah, but you use Kafka? Yeah, of course. So you use Java. Oh, really? Yes, right? Because the users have no idea. The same goes for Cassandra, Elasticsearch. And how do you make sure that this stuff is secure at runtime in production? Hard. But if you have this stuff in the JVM, it might be easier. So then you have code scanners like Sneak, Coverty, Contrast. They can work in all these different areas, like in the development, CI, CD systems, or even there's Anchor that you can use for container scanning. If you create containers, you can also scan them. And then, for example, you can use Azul for vulnerability detection in production to make sure that everything is secure. That means this is shift left, and this is what we define validate right, because we can make sure that at runtime, it's still secure. If you trust the CI CD system in a Java environment, then that doesn't mean it's safe because Java is dynamic. At runtime, stuff can change. Co you can drag in code, and then this is not scanned, right? So this is the idea that we had with, the, with our own vulnerability detection. So the takeaway from that session, you should, follow an automatic patch schedule. Usually you take the one from OpenJDK, right? So which is now 21. Then there's in 13 days is the next update available. And then you can follow this one to update your own stuff. You should automate application packaging with JLink. Take a look at it at least. It's, it's really, it, I was surprised when I, I always ask these questions and it's people, some people heard about it. Using it is a totally different story. Right. It makes sense to use JLink. Uh, you should watch for CVEs and libraries. Right? So there should be, who has a specific security department in his company? Oh, this is good. Great. Because these guys usually do that, so you, you usually don't have to. And you should use vulnerability scanners. Right? And it shouldn't stop at CI, CD. You should think about production. You can use agents. If you are fine with the overhead, that's good. Or you can use other stuff. So, that, do you need to be a security expert? No. But you need to be aware about security. That's the important part. And with this I say stay secure. We still have 11 minutes if you have questions, but keep in mind there's free beer. All right? Just to make sure that everybody that was asleep now awakes. Right? There's free beer and you can get it here. Okay? Thanks for attending. So like I said, there are, if we have still time if there are questions. I don't know if there's uh, someone. If not, you can either come down or 
ask me at the booth. Don't forget to sign up for the party.